Beginning with verse 1. Hold on, I've got to make a decision real quickly here. Yes, and we'll go all the way through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings, wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him. And he went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings, wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been laid, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabona, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Here ends the reading of the word. May God bless to our understanding this week. <coughs> Will you pray with me? O oh God of might and glory, of empty tombs and hopeful futures, we come before you this day, having sung your praises and read from your holy word. Now guide and direct us, O oh God, as we seek to interpret your word. Be with us all, that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts together might be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, I put the title up. It says the greatest story ever told. And I'll tell you why I made that title, and then I'll tell you why I'm going to ignore that title. <coughs> when Easter comes around, you make up your sermon titles in series seven weeks in advance, if you're in the preaching business. And a lot happens in seven weeks. And honestly, what I was thinking of playing on was the fact that the Lenten series we cooperated with was based on telling of our stories. And since... Maybe three or four of us really got exposed to that. The more I thought about that title today, the more I thought, you know, it just doesn't fit. We just didn't get the story background it takes for me to talk about that in that way. So, as of yesterday, this sermon's title was, So What? I thought you'd like that one a little better anyway. <laughs> that sounds a little more like me. <laughs> so what? Or maybe that's so what? Ooh. I'm going to make a little confession here. There's 
a couple of people in the room that have already heard this confession. I did it at noon on Friday. I did not repeat it in the evening on Friday. We preachers agonize over Easter. We sit in our studies and we pray fervently for something new to say. Because we know that Easter is the most familiar story. We know that the Easter story is one that some folks may be the only Christ story they hear between now and Christmas. We know this. And we pray and we agonize and we say, God, this day that I loved so much as I was being called into ministry, I've now preached 23 times and I'm running out of stuff to say. Even if it is new ears. And it's hard. Let me just admit it. It's hard. It's hard to try to find something new in a story so familiar that not only do you hear it in church, but you hear it on TV, in movies, repeated over and over in various other media. There's probably 15 versions of the Easter story on FaceTime and YouTube this morning. I didn't look, but I'm betting I'm not far off. What can we do that's new? What can I give you that's fresh, that challenges you, that, that, that engages your mind in a way it hasn't been before? God, help me. What can I do? And it kind of led me to a moment of skepticism. I know I'm a little prone to that anyway. And that's when I started saying to myself as I prepared today's message, so what? What, what difference does Easter make? Why, why does it matter? Why do we show up? Why do we come here a story we already know? So what? There are several easy answers, right? We know the easy answers. Easter matters because Easter is the fulfillment of the promise of resurrection. Easter is the once and for all, death is defeated, God wins, hallelujah, amen. New life happens. Yay. Tim, could you give that a little more enthusiasm next time? If you're going to lead it, I need a cheerleader on that. Let's cheer. Let's cheer. But here's the thing, folks. Faith needs to not just be an immunization towards eternal death. Faith is not meant to be just a get my shot and know I'm covered. I preach the same sermon around baptisms all the time, that when you enter those waters, that's the beginning, not the, ooh, I've got it now. Because if we're willing to be honest with ourselves, and I hope we are today, one of the challenges we have as church is to say, okay, what difference does it make to be a believer? What difference does it make to have faith in God through Jesus Christ? How does that work on me? How does that change me? How does that challenge me? How does that make me grow? See. If faith in Christ is 100% about salvation, then you're missing a huge opportunity. Because life, modeling that which Christ gave to us, is so much more a blessing than without it. One of my dear friends once said to me, if they could prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, that they found the bones of Jesus of Nazareth buried in a tomb, not risen, I would still live exactly the way he taught. Because I have been so richly blessed by trying to live as a Christian. And I think of all those words, church, the word I want you to hear most is trying. 
You see, we live in a society that is bombarding us with the idea and the notion that Christians are somehow supposed to be perfect, better, and absolutely wonderful, and if necessary, doormats. And I'm not here to tell you that today. I'm here to tell you that the so what I hear in the Easter story is finally faith illustrates for us the opportunity not only of new life, but, nice, well done, but also the opportunity to live life newly. That's not a joke. Don't do it. The opportunity. To live life newly. Not perfectly, not saintly, not absolutely Jesus like, but newly. On this Easter, I find myself at a little bit of a precipice here at First Christian Church. We've been together. About eight and a half, nine months. We darn near could have had a baby. <laughs> Gee, my wife just said no. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the questions as a pastor I ask myself regularly is, how are we doing? How are we making progress? Are we doing new things? Are our ministries making a difference? And I looked back at my outreach notes, and one of the things that jumped off the page at me is today, today, not tomorrow, today, we need to find 10 folks willing to help make our share of a million meals. Now, Mike is accepting sign-ups for that. It's a two-hour commitment, one day, one time, right? Is that right? Two hours? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Mm -hmm. Two hours, one day, one time. I believe the day is the first Sunday in May. Yeah. Ten people to go gather together the basic stuff. It's all going to be there. You just have to put on clean gloves and a hairnet probably and put it together. The food goes in a bag. The bag gets hermetically sealed. It sits in a jar and Funkin' Wag goes back. No, wait, that's a different story. That was for the old people. Right? Because people who never watched Carson have no idea what that joke was. It gets sealed and it becomes a meal that is nutritionally sound, if not glamorous. For folks who really need meals. We've committed to put together a team. Ten people. Mike needs ten people. You know what would make me overjoyed? Anyone want to guess? Twenty is exactly what would make me overjoyed. Let's put together two teams. Today, right after church. Mike's in the back at the soundboard if you're not sure who he is. Twenty people that are willing to give two hours on the first Sunday of May to help feed a million people. We can do it. Now here's the thing. Last August, I'm not sure I would have boldly proclaimed that. I'm not sure I would have told you we could put together 20 people. Because frankly, the first few days I was here, there was only 30 of us. And a handful of us couldn't walk. <laughs> now, we haven't healed the walking part. I don't want to over-exaggerate the impact. But the reality is, we're closer to 50 of us on a regular basis these days and moving in the right direction. So what? Well, so what means we're starting to actually spend time doing what Christ called us to do again. We're not worrying about keeping the doors open. We're worrying about serving people. I look at my notes from the outreach committee meeting I just had, and it said, oh, we've got to remember to start promoting crop walk and get people to actually walk and raise money for hunger. Oh, we've got to put together a couple of teams to do this million meals program. Oh, Relay Lot for Life is coming, and we've got to start getting ready for that. 
oh, let's talk about the idea of putting out some kind of something on the corner at Halloween and reaching out to the neighborhood kids, not with tracts and Bible verses, but candy and a warm greeting to their parents. Oh, let's talk about what we can do. Okay, I made this one up, but I'm willing to throw it out there. Around the 4th of July, which happens to fall on a Saturday, maybe have a block party. Okay, I came up with that one on the drive down this morning, so it's, it's still a little raw. But why not? Why not? Why not? Let's start with why. Because the so what of Jesus' resurrection means we are now called to be people of love and hope. It's taken me 25 years of ministry to come down to the reality that the gospel calls us to that basic, simple thing. I've never used that phrase in those words with you before today. I've never used it with anyone before today. But here's the aha of my Easter. Resurrection gives us real hope. Let me put it this way. Hope without a foundation is really basically wishful thinking, right? I hope the Badgers win on tomorrow. I was going to say on Monday, but it's tomorrow. I do hope they win, but I have no foundation for that. I've seen Duke play. I know it's going to be a tough battle. I'm going to be proud of their result regardless, but I don't have that foundation. I'm hopeful. I'm thinking wishfully. I hope there's not an accident on the freeway when I try to go home tonight. I hope, see we use this word hope regularly, don't we? I hope you get that promotion. I hope you're happy in your old age. No, I wish those things and I wish them genuinely. But hope. Hope is that wishfulness, that, that, that want with a foundation of faith. One of my favorite professors, I've talked about him before, now to see Stanley Lester, talked about God living in the future and calling us constantly toward a hopeful future. I love that image. I love the idea that God knows what's coming and is urging us, calling us forward to the most hopeful future we can imagine or encounter. I love the idea that God sees the opportunity to feed people and calls us forth to work to make it happen. I love the idea that God sees the possibility of the difficulty of illness that is coming and is calling us forward to the hopeful future of even if not cured, knowing that we are loved and surrounded by family members and friends who show up. I love the idea that faith allows us to look forward to new life with a hopeful future that says God is in control, knows the future, and is calling us toward the very good news of Jesus Christ. And if we can do that in a loving way, Sharing love with each other in the name of God, then church, we are being faithful. And so it's Easter again. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. Yeah, we know the song. We even get to sing the other one later, right? I'm sorry. Quick aside. One of my favorite cartoons that circulates among the preachers this time of year is the one that says, guys stand in the back of church shaking the pastor's hand and says, you know, pastor, I'd come to church more often if you didn't always sing the same two songs. And here I am guilty. Put those songs in again. What can I tell you? <laughs> Faith gives hope meaning. Your hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ, the solid rock, I say, stand. All other ground is sinking sand. We come to hear the story of faith that gives us hope. And next.
week, next week, we're going to tell it all again. So if you're coming because it's a story you know and you feel familiar, then I've got good news. We're going to keep telling the story. We're going to keep saying our faith makes a difference because it gives us hope and encourages and empowers us to reach out to others who need to feel that hope. And that, dear friends, is a sign of new life. <laughs> Our hymn of commitment is number 218. One of the other things us preacher types do is we sit around and agonize over the words we put out there. What does it mean to have a hymn of commitment? What am I asking them to commit to? Is it, is it scary? Is it difficult? Is it dangerous? Yes. It is. Because the hymn of commitment is the opportunity to commit your life to Jesus Christ. And that is scary. And it is difficult. And it is dangerous. And it is filled with more joy and hope than anything else you can possibly do with your life. So as we stand as we're able together and sing this hymn of commitment, I invite you, if you've never confessed faith in Jesus Christ, to open yourself to do so today. Likewise, if you've been searching for a church home that's willing to start getting dirty and get out there and make a difference in other people's lives, to share hope, to share love, I invite you to come be a part of this church as we stand together and sing hymn number 218.